Oscar, what do you think? We are ready. Great. Almost. Oh. Yep. So welcome back, everyone. I'm Sophia Alexanderson from Shame Music and Performing Arts. And hello to everyone back home. We are really glad we got some people online as well. So uh, what we are going to do now is to present to you what is music technology and how can music technology be used in various ways. So She Music is a knowledge center for artistic development and inclusion with a specific focus on disability inclusion. And we have a long history of actually using music technology. So we have a vision that everyone should have the opportunity to express themselves artistically in a world where difference is seen as valuable. And for us, music tech is a way to ensure that everyone has equal opportunities to both create and to perform and to participate. So participation is really important as well as co-creation. So today here, I'm really happy that you will meet Nigel Osborne. Uh, and Patricia Alessandrini, and they are both in our academic board. And we have Peter Larson, who is a musician who's been taking part in our work since we started 20 years ago. And we also have Thomas Hulenvi Klingberg, who is a composer and workshop leader who's also been working with us for a very long time. And from the UK, we are joining also Clarence Adu, a musician who's been working with Royal Northern Symphonia, and now we are an S. So, uh, I hope you will also get a chance to do a little bit of participatory work now because we've been listening a lot the whole day. Lots of interesting things and we are really delighted to be part of the Muse IT project and the launch here today. And what we were doing in the project will hopefully be a little bit clearer for you after this session. So I leave over to Patricia now. <coughs> Even better, okay. Um, so, Sophia, you were just saying that uh, Peter has been performing with you for 20 years now. So, Peter, uh, over those 20 years, you've become a, a kind of a pioneer in this area of performance and development of these, these, uh, these interfaces and instruments these for electronic music. Um, can you tell us a little bit how, how that started? Yeah. I met music technology for the first time on a course, um, share, share music course, uh, back in 2002. And before that, I haven't been able to play any instrument because of my impaired motoric skills. So I, I, I haven't found a um, conventional instrument that suited me my impairment and so on. So so I was a bit scared to come to this course actually because I I thought they um, um, come uh, come up for me. Um, okay. I'll give myself away. Yeah, yeah. So um, but after three days I actually played blues along with this gentleman and and his tutor uh, uh, colleagues, and it was the first time that I really uh, came across a forum that I could express my music fully. About, or, yeah, and it was incredible feeling for me. I thank you for that. Mm. Um, yeah, it was that. Thank you, Peter. And I think we actually have a musical example uh, that we're going to hear now. Uh, so if we could play musical example number eight, uh, which is uh, Peter uh, performing.
And so I'll just give you a little background on this. This is uh, our collaboration together on a project called Mongewechse. And the idea was, it was two ensembles. It was Influence Ensemble, um, and also uh, an ensemble of, of new music in Sweden called Gallego. And uh, all of the members of the Influence Ensemble were also creators in the sense that we, we imagined scenarios together. And Peter's scenario was a color organ. So what you're going to hear is an instrument that makes the color organ. I suggest that we're going to continue talking just a little bit. Oh, are you are you okay now? Okay. Um, Peter, I wanted to ask you another question mm -hmm. um, about instruments. Um, what do you look for in a musical, in an electronic musical instrument? Um, and in the instruments that you played, what what do you think could be improved? Yeah. I uh, wrote a, uh, I, on the interface to to um,
Nice. Thank you so much, Peter. That's, mm. that's an amazing idea. Um, I think now we're going to hear your little clip. over to Nigel now. Thank you, Patricia. And I'm going to introduce Clarence Edu. Clarence, are you there? Uh, I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. It's very nice to hear you too. Thank you, Clarence. Right. So uh, my pleasure to introduce Clarence because I'm introducing a national treasure. Anybody living in the United Kingdom, uh, Clarence is a national treasure of our culture. And I would venture to say that Clarence is an international treasure for the world as well. Uh, why? Because he's, he's going to hate hearing this, I'm saying. Um, uh, uh, but never mind, Clarence, or we'll make it up to you sometime. Um, so he, he's a wonderful musician, and that should be enough to be a national treasure. But uh, Clarence is much more. Clarence in his life has crossed thresholds that others haven't. And in crossing those thresholds, he has liberated others. For example, Clarence in his earlier life professionally was a crack trumpet player. He was a soloist for symphony orchestras for the Royal Northern Symphonia, playing the Beethoven Tchaikovsky repertoire to the highest of international standards, being headhunted by other great orchestras. But at the same time, he was playing you know, rock and roll and jazz. Now, yes, musicians cross over, we all do, um, but not like that. It's as if in Clarence's life, it's as if, you know, Yehudi Menuhin got mixed up with Stefan Grappelli, or that Eric Clapton and John Williams somehow got fused sometime in some strange experiment. Um, <laughs> that's what Clarence managed to do. Uh, so it was, and, and that liberated the rest of us. Uh, 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 so it wasn't just him. Um, and then uh, it came to another big threshold, which I want Clarence to tell you about himself. So Clarence, I've got two questions. So I'm going to say them right now at the beginning. Um, uh, because I know how good you are organizing time, so this gives you your chance to organize your own time. Um, first question is, could you tell us about what happened and what made this difficult, the most difficult of all transitions for you? And the second thing is, what then after that did you find? What were the musical instruments? What were the musical means of expression that became available to you through this technology uh, that followed on from that? Thank you, Kranz. I hand over to you. Well, thank you, Nigel. Well, in 1995, uh, can you all hear me clearly? You, you can hear okay? Yes, um, I was uh, in a terrible car accident where the car rolled over and damaged my spinal cord, which meant uh, I lost connection between my brain and the rest of my body. So prior to that, as Nigel was saying, I was enjoying life as a musician, doing all sorts of music. And so, um, how unbelievable that was for something like that to happen in a second. Um, and so um, I was in hospital for a year. And in my mind, I never thought that I would never be involved in music. I had absolutely no idea how this could be about. Um, and so I came uh, home and, um, you know, after a bit of time of respite um, and uh, rehab, um, uh, out of the blue, somebody contacted somebody else, you know how it goes, and um, Rolf Gelha, um, an amazing uh, musical um, composer, um, musical uh, uh, instruments and creator of um, new uh, innovative uh, uh, instruments through technology, and I was fortunate enough to be put in touch with him, and he came to spend a few days at my house and saw how limited um, disability I have. I can only move my head from side to side, 
and I could still breathe without a ventilator. And so I have a little blue tube. You'll see this um, uh, later on the screen. Um, and so um, uh, how amazing that was for me. And so playing music, when I'm concentrating and focused on music, I'm totally unaware that I'm paralyzed and it transforms me into another world. And so when I got the ability to uh, learn uh, a new instrument, um, it uh, words can't express. It was like um, taking half the paralysis away. And so when I'm playing music, um, that means um, so much. I don't know if I include, uh, included the second answer, um, um, Nigel. Uh, what was the second? Am I answering yes, the thing was, is what are the, uh, what are the instruments you're using to, in order to achieve this? What are they? Okay. So um, uh, what Rolf Gerhard bought and built uh, for me is uh, using a laptop. Um, and he built some special software uh, in it. And, you know, initially we, we sat together, we could turn sounds and things on and off, but that wasn't good enough. I wanted to play with some sort of expression and dynamics and we're still all the time striving for improvements in that area. Um, sadly, Rolf Gerhard is no longer with us, but he, he, he was so interested to um, develop this uh, instrument for me and um, um, it's given me a lifeline, in fact, I was uh, um, recently in touch with his family. I realized some of the music awards that I've been given, um, I, I would have never had those had I not had an instrument like this to play. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the handover, I think you've got some footage, haven't you, which, that, that we might be able to play. Indeed, if we could go to, I think it's musical example number nine, uh, Clarence. And this is Clarence performing with the RNS. RNS Moves is Royal Northern Symphonia's inclusive ensemble which brings together professional musicians with and without disabilities. I get to wear a uh, headset with sensors on it that moves a mouse around the screen and a little blow tube around the side which I blow down to create notes and music and stuff like that. instrument um, and that enables me to be creative and have a different voice again and to be able to participate to be amongst them making music using technology is an amazing fulfilling feeling for me. Thank you Clarence and we'll be hearing more of Clarence in a moment. A quick word if I may um, about Rolf Gehlha. It may seem inappropriate to launch into an eulogy in a conference, but um, you'll see why in a moment. Uh, Rolf Gehlha, son of a German rocket scientist. Um, his dad uh, was one of Werner von Braun's engineers who designed the V2s that bombed the British cities. Um, at the end of the war, um, uh, his father was invited by the Americans, <laughs> politely but <laughs> compulsively, um, to New Mexico. Uh, where he then went on the American rocket program, what eventually became NASA. Um, Rolf was brought up as therefore a bright-eyed American boy with a fantastic German engineering background. Um, uh, so good combination. Um, and then he became assistant you know, as a musician to Karl-Heinz Stockhausen. And a composer who 
really gave birth to most of what we're talking about in electronic music and every kind of electronic music. I'm talking about, you know, electronica, dance music, hip hop. It's all coming from Stockhausen's inventions. And whose inventions are behind Stockhausen? Rolf. And Rolf and I became friends and worked together for some time. So I was delighted when he married um, an Armenian girl called Nuritsa Motosian, that they, were, they chose to live in Britain. So we we're going to be neighbors. And I was even more delighted when Rolf decided in his life that he would devote it to music for disability. Why? Why did this massive star of modernism, you know, the canon of modernism, why did this guy come and do music for disability? Well, for exactly the reason that Femke said, um, for fun and curiosity, but also something very, very important. Rolf and I both felt that the mainstreams of science and culture were pretty dead bogged down by bureaucracies and mediocrities and, uh, and lack of courage. Um, so where could we do stuff? At the margins. So for example, exactly at the, at the intersections of disciplines, we can do stuff that's exciting, free of the bureaucracy. And of course, much more important, the frontiers of society. And the, one of the most creative frontiers of society is the frontier of disability, uh, the frontier of ability. <laughs> excuse me, uh, capability. That's what we call it in Scotland, is capability, we refuse to. Uh, uh, but I know in Sweden it's disability, so we must use it. But um, uh, that's the place where there's excitement and where things can happen. And so that's where we're working, where I'm so happy about Muse IT, is that we're working there on the intersection of disciplines and at this creative place. And as Fanka said, this is for everybody. Things we've made on the threshold of disability have turned out to be very good for everybody. Uh, so that's why we're doing it. And the R part that we're kind of running into today is to do with um, uh, the electronic um, uh, technical instruments and, and the co-creation platform that we're going to create to be able people to be able to co-create at a distance. We've got problems doing that. One is latency. The other is sound quality, things like Zoom. And we have a, a solution for that, which Patricia will describe in a moment. Then we've got things like enhancing the communication. It would be very, very nice for people co-creating at a distance to be able to feel what they're feeling, other people are feeling, to feel the sensations that are going through the body of the person that is playing with you. You can feel that when you're next to them in a room, there are all sorts of physiological, neurophysiological explanations of that, but you can't 200 kilometers away. And so we think that you can. We're going to work on this to maximize the human information that travels between people creating. Um, or EEG sensors, the whole lot, we're, um, uh, and we're going to use the whole lot. And that will be of benefit. You know, this is a, this is a mankind project. It's not just a music project. So I'm very proud to be involved in it. Hand over to somebody I'm very proud to work with. This is Patricia. You say something about what we've got already with our no latency platform. Uh, so, so at, at uh, Stanford University, it's been a long time now, actually, uh, that we've had uh, a software called JackTrip, which is for uh, low latency, uncompressed audio over the network. Um, some of you might have noticed, I mean, we're going to do a little music making now through the genius of Tomas and, and, uh, and performers like Peter and, and Clarence who are used to working with all kinds of technology, including technology that we're just making and trying out. So they're very patient with these things. Um, but there's, there's a lot of barriers uh, with, with using Zoom. Um, and so using JackTrip allows you to have this really in-person experience. And just to, to give an example of that, um, again, as I say, we've been using it for a long time. It was used in the European project Comedia, which was particularly uh, specifically about uh, network performance. Uh, that was in 2010 to 2011. Um, and, but then of course, during the pandemic, suddenly there was a need for this tool. Um, and in spring 2020, our ensembles at Stanford stayed online. Basically, we didn't, some ensembles didn't lose a single rehearsal um, because we went straight to Jack Trip. And because some of the ensembles had already been using it, for instance, to perform a piece in which each performer is in a different room in the building and you can walk through the building and hear the music sort of fade in and out perfectly in sync 
between the different performers. So we'd already been experiencing, experimenting with it. But what we needed to do then was to make it more accessible. Uh, so part of the accessibility was in user features, you know, just like Peter was talking about, user features are so important. Um, so we had it on a phone app, and now we have a completely uh, browser-based, uh, completely freeware. You can go to the Jack Trip Foundation, and you can open up a session, and you can, you can play with it. Um, but now we're going to build in more features, um, such as haptics. Um, and co-creativity, and also, just as Nigel said, um, working with the experience, because when we have co-creativity, when we have an experience with an AI agent, we don't just want an AI agent that responds to us in some generic way. We, we want a meaningful experience. We, we want to have joy, uh, whatever we, we want from those musical experiences that we have with human beings. So we're going to be working also with, with the emotional content of those experiences. Thank you. Let's hand over to Thomas and Clarence and Peter, of course. Thank you very much. Uh, Oscar, do you want me to bring the headset to then? Uh, is that all right? Then I have two hands free. Okay, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> we are, N Nigel was using a word which was curiosity. And curiosity is for me, that's one of the most basic parts about making music and maybe even, maybe even for life in general. But um, the curiosity about thinking about doing, not just do I do right, do I do wrong, well, just try it. So let's make a small piece together. This piece is called first and second row uh, song. And you, you, this is a Brian Eno invention and uh, you tap it in the way that you want, was good. Just Nice. function so now those of you who have been playing you are somewhere here do you know what you did That piece is in the past. Let's make the second uh, version out of it. such a thing, a co collaborative piece, and there is no right, there is no wrong in how to play. If you look at a guitar or a saxophone or something like that, there is so many ways that gives you idea about 
this is how it's supposed to be played. But having a blue screen like this, there is no wrongs and more or less no rights. So it's just to go on. I would like to have a duet though. So two volunteer people come up to me now. Patricia, are you one of the volunteers? Oh, yes. We didn't discuss this before. <laughs> so, yes. You have the bloom and someone else has this other one. So, yes, please. Someone. Oh, good. So, let's uh, have a little... Uh, the one that you used, the one that we had before, that was just not swipeable. Maybe the new one is swipeable. We'll see what happens. So a small duetto from you, please. And I think that we will start with Patricia. Then there is a little bit of surprise what comes from, what's your name? Andrea. Andrea. All right, Patricia, here we go. Distance. So, uh, Andrea, will you? There is something wrong with that one. It sounds, looks like. Um, we had uh, a little bit of. Uh, sometimes the, the wires do work. Sometimes the wires do not work. When you have Bluetooth, then you always have, as you talked about the latency, having the wires. Well, sometimes it works, sometimes it does not. So, I say that we will do like this. That, please put that one away. And we keep Andrea up. Thank you, Patricia, for your introduction of this one. Yes, no, you're going to play with the f your friend over there. So, um, so now we're back. Yes, okay. And now I think that we do will start with Andrea, please. <laughs> Please go on. It's a good thing when you feel that there is something. Peter, you join in.
Thank you very much. Another one, duetto together with Peter, who is up. No volunteer. Oh yes, we have a volunteer. Do you want to use the cello, or do you, are you a saxophone man? No. You're a pianist. Now you're a celloist. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great work. There is always something interesting about, as we talked about, the exactly not knowing what to do with the right or the wrongs. And uh, and if one of you are familiar with contact microphones, good. Uh, It's a very easy idea. Uh, it's it's a can. It's nothing more than a can. When I was uh, up with Clarence doing uh, a project in uh, Upwind RNS Moves, we made a piece uh, which was um, we played it both with the acoustic instrument and also with an electronic. Uh, uh, more an electronic landscape. And one of the things was a can. And the oboe player, he fell so in love with it, with the can. So he was, oh man, I do play the oboe, but I'm the can man. <laughs> and that was this idea. So someone, please join me. You know what it is. It's just to come up. There's no wrongs. There is no rights. Please, let's explore this one together with Mr. Osborne here. Right. Yep. And of course, we do have this one over here, and we have Peter here. So, someone coming up to me now. Maybe you? Yeah, I don't know. Nobody else said so. <laughs> and we just. Uh, what's that? Uh? Yeah, they think so. Um, of an echo. This has already started. Listen to what happens around, yeah? 
Now we have some iPads. We have one iPad that which did not uh, something but the connectors didn't work. We have another one there. We have the can. We have our things that we do. We have our people at home in front of the Zoom. We're going to soon pick up Clarence too. Before we do that, we got a piece of history uh, in front of us here, and I think it's a it's a good thing to actually bring up this cabinet. How many of you exactly know what this is? A few of you, half of it, or sort of. This is this is uh, from 1905, and it's uh, it's an, uh, the first electronic instrument uh, built in the world. And uh, uh, John Cage, he once talked talked about uh, the theremin. He said. The theremin is an experimental instrument and should therefore be played in an experimental way. Of course, you can play your violin or sonatas if you are handling it like Clara Rockmore or one of those masters. But still, there is the exploration, the curiosity about theremin is the main, the, the happiness of it. Who wants to be the what do you call it? Who wants to be the 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 the, ther the first theremin player here around? I will help you. Someone. And the the funny thing about this instrument is that if you touch it, then you then you do it wrong. So it's just a matter of air. 
So your left hand, it's the volume. Now it's silent. And your right hand, the closer you are to this one, the higher is the pitch and the lower you come. Okay. Well, show us. Lift your left hand slowly. Left hand slowly. Lift. And remember, it's not sensitive in that direction, just in this direction. So up with the volume a little bit. Lift your hand. It's a little bit of a vibrato, like a shivering. Good. person who wants to try to play it. You have your possibility now. You don't know what's the next time you're going to hit the theremin. Yes. Left hand. Make it silent and then give a nice... Good. There is an iPad over there. There is no rights, there is no wrongs. Just go there, someone. Clarence? Yes, I am, yes. All right. 
Clarence, uh, we're going to hear you and me and Peter doing a new piece. It's called Clarence Chant. And it's based on the letters in the name of Clarence Adu that gives us the C and that gives us the A, that gives us the E, that gives us the C, that gives us the E, that gives us an A and a D. So, well, are you ready, Peter? Yes, I am. Trumpets on. Mm -hmm. Clarence? Yes. Mm -hmm. Lovely to be here. In Borås. Thank you so much for inviting us. Um, world premiere yeah. on the Clarence chant. Three, four. <laughs>
welcome up, Nigel. The wrapping up question, uh, or uh, what's on the schedule? I don't remember what the tagline was. It was something about wrapping up schedule five minutes at tag. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. And thank you to the audience for participating. Yeah. So, yes, do you have any questions? Any reflections? It doesn't need to be a question. Everyone is kind of... Perhaps, yes, please. May, we should just have the microphone. It's about a uh, question um, in the frontiers of the... Uh, um, um, harmonies and the rules of music, we can say, and where is um, a more uh, and a more uh, free interpretation? Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on, on how you manage these frontiers? Uh, uh, yeah. D d uh, uh. Um, Maybe I can fill in because yes. it was a really good question. Yes, it's very good. I think that first of all, this is the first time, uh, and we are discovering. And so it's a process of discovery. And what you're hearing is people finding things that they want and then losing them and finding them again. The point being that when we work together for enough time, we get to find them all the time, and we start creating language. So, for example, the first thing on the iPad, very much like a failing organ prelude for me, uh, and uh, uh, wasn't far away. And if we worked at that aesthetic with our ears, we would find our way towards it. So um, it's, it's that process of discovery and rediscovery of language. Um, that's how it came to start with. People improvising together found things they liked. The rules of nature, the harmonic series is important. Uh, in generating intervals that human beings like, our uh, anatomy agrees with it. Uh, on the other hand, we also like dissonances, provided we released from them. Uh, so we get to do those things. And, and my experience of it is, particularly working with your Clarence and P Peter, is, is that those things happen quite quickly. You know, when we, we find a language, it comes. So th does, that, does that help? Yeah, and I also think that there is we, oh, I got my headset. Uh, uh, there is uh, always a, a possibility that we do frame ourselves a little bit too early. If um, I mean, considering considering a small child who who bashes on the guitar, then they do instantly like the sound. They, it's not it's not the it's not the correct uh, grip. It's it's the sound. It's the curiosity. It's the, um, I think in one way it's about the, the, uh, the happiness of create, creating. And sometimes it could be harmonic, we could, we could angle it in a way so it's C major, F minor, blah, 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 talking scales and notes. But we can also uh, make it um, uh, a little bit more free, but it still sound like in many of those times, it sounded many music wise when you were playing together and when the whole Say the sequence, fantastic, when the whole orchestra here on the seats were doing their own things, but it was in the same room and it was something that sounded like, a, like an ensemble. Uh, so instantly it became something interesting and then you can narrow it to make it more, I mean, written music or structure it in a way of music. But this, this part of exploring, investigating, it needs to be free, so it could be, it could go in any ways. Also, musical culture has always done that. So, um, for example, we often use pentatonics, five note scales, dee, da, dum, pom, pom, which is exactly what in Indonesian music, the slendro scale is. In other words, music has boiled down sometimes limited choices within which you can be inventive. Uh, and so we often do that. And it's no different from a gamelan player or an Arabic musician will be using a makam. Um, it, we, we are, and we're able to get to that level of sophistication. We're even able to tune makams properly <laughs> with our electronic. <laughs> so uh, we can do fabulous things in, in that way. Quickly, notice about cochlear implants. Um, yes, below middle C soups better, uh, but we've also created music for cochlear implants. People who to listen to, we do this. So just to say that that does exist, uh, uh, we, we're working on that. Thank you. So do you want to see if there are any more questions? I thought I saw someone waving. 
Maybe we should add that we actually do in this what we call the mobile music kit for kids. Uh, we have been doing like for all all 10 years old in one of a neighboring municipality, like a couple of thousands. And then it's like in 90 minutes creating your own music and it can be also, perhaps we've been in a very kind of different mood here today, but you can be of course in different kinds of moods and different kinds of framework, just like Nigel and Thomas explained. So I think also looking back to what we've been doing for the last 20 years, we've been working a lot with different composers, different musicians, etc. And it's been like a quite mix of what you can do and what is the starting point. And also the different kinds of layers, how you can work in a co-creative process. And I think that's what we are interested in looking further into. So yeah, maybe we should close then, Nasreen. I know there are other things coming. Yeah, sorry, there is. A, is this time for the last question? Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. So um, I'm no music theorist, but I just wanted to follow on from uh, one of the comments that was made about uh, the iPad app and wondering um, if one of the areas of development could be uh, into a, a pedagogic in terms of teaching people about um, uh not so much the scales necessarily but the uh, is it the modes and so on so restricting um in the same way as you were requesting that the the full range of notes is sort of restricted if that could be restricted in a way whether it's the order or the sequence or the ones that are selected to give people the feel for the sound of how some of those modes actually sound Absolutely. I mean, in, when I was teaching in Edinburgh in our AI music department, um, we developed um, uh, programs for teaching people how to harmonize Bach chorales, um, hearing what fits together and what doesn't. And modes certainly very nice to do that. So yes, we're well on the way with that. Um, I think that um, it's probably that what held us off a bit is it's a process that also benefits from a human interaction. Um, and so I think that we'll find that our technology, AI technology in that particular pedagogic instance is gonna be a support rather than the core of it. That's, that's what we discovered over the years, um, but a very good support. And some of the results from write, writing, teaching kids to write Bach oral harmonization, which isn't easy. Bach's very sophisticated in doing that. Uh, we're very successful. So there you go, definitely. Thank you so very much, everyone. Thank you here and Clarence. Thank you.